Hi everyone, in today's video we're going to be looking at Half-Life. So by the end of the lesson you should be able to give me a definition of Half-Life, identify Half-Life from a graph, and suggest how it can affect other properties of radioactivity, um, which we'll think about a little bit um, when we do some past paper questions. Okay, so let's think about, here's a, a nucleus, and we know that it's an alpha emitter, so it's going to decay into its daughter nucleus, plus a 4 to alpha. Um, and so we might write that as AZX, um, and that's going to turn into A minus 4, Z minus 2, Y, daughter nucleus. Obviously you replace the X and the Y with the actual uh, element symbols. So is there any way of knowing when it's going to decay? And that turns out to be a relatively complicated question. Um, a key thing that you need to know for CIE is that all radioactive decay is random and spontaneous. So what does that mean? Um, random means we cannot predict when the decay is going to occur. It'll happen at any time. And spontaneous means we cannot control it. You can't force a nucleus to decay more quickly. Now that's quite different to chemistry, because in chemistry you can make a, re a chemical reaction happen more quickly by putting in more heat. But it turns out it doesn't work that way with radioactive decay. You can make things hotter if you like, but that's not actually going to affect the rate of decay at all. So you might think that this is going to be an impossible task to ever do anything about predicting what's going to happen. But while we can't predict when an individual nucleus is going to decay, we can say how likely it is to decay at any moment. Now those two things can seem to be in conflict at first. We're saying we can't predict when it will happen, but we can say how likely it is to happen. That can sound like a contradiction, but it's actually not. And it's quite simple um, if you think about dice. So let's talk about this first. So I want you to imagine, and we would li I'd like to do this in the class with you, um, so hopefully we'll get the chance to actually do this in the lesson. I want you to imagine that I give you a big, big, big bag of dice. So I'm going to start off with 600 dice. Um, and so before I've thrown any of them, I have 600. Now, as hopefully you know from maths, if you roll a single dice, you have absolutely no way of knowing what number will come up. But you do know how likely you are to get a number. So what I want you to imagine is we're going to start with our 600 dice. And after we've rolled them all, so we're going to roll all of them. And then we're going to remove any dice that came up with a 6. So we're going to take out all the 6s. Is it possible to work out what will happen during this experiment? Well, actually it is. On our first throw, so obviously uh, the first one, these ones will be blank. On throw number one, we're going to throw 600 dice. So how many would, sh would we expect to throw a six? Well, if I throw a six-sided dice, you've got a one in six chance of each number coming up. So I would expect one-sixth of my dice to decay. So in this case, I would expect 100 dice to show a 6, and 500 dice to not throw, show a 6. Now if I then remove my 100 dice, I've now only got 500 left. On the next throw, I'd expect one-sixth of all my dice again to decay. So what I need to do is work out what one sixth of 500 is. So let's just do 500 divided by 6. That's 83 and a bit. So I'm just going to say I would expect about 83 dice to show that. So that would mean that I'd have 500 minus 86. I'd have 400 and 14 dice that didn't throw a 6. So if I remove all of my ones that did throw a 6, I would expect to have 414 dice on the next throw. Do a third throw. So this time I have 414 dice. So I would expect one sixth of them to decay. 
Now, one sixth of 114 is about 69 dice. So that would leave me with 345 dice not decayed. Now, what you can see is that as time goes on, this number decreases. I have less dice decaying each second. Now, for an individual dice, I can't predict whether it will stay, whether it be a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, but I can say that roughly every throw, a sixth of them decays. And it's the same with radiation. So if I have a radioactive sample, so I put it here, it's going to be giving off alpha, beta, or gamma, or a combination of all three. And I can detect that with a radiation detector. So it's usually called a Geiger counter. Um, and that gives me an activity. So the activity of a sample is the number of ionizing radiation particles it emits every second and is measured in becquerels. So one becquerel means one decay every second. So if you think about it this way, if I'm thinking about my dice, if I'm saying that the sixes is the same as it decaying, then what I can say is that after the first throw, I have an activity of 100 becquerels. I've got 100 bits of radiation coming out. On the second throw, I have an activity of 83 becquerels. And what you should hopefully see is that over time, as my activity goes on and on, I lose activity. I, as I have fewer and fewer radioactive particles left, I'm going to have fewer and fewer doing their decay. So let's just see what that looks like. I just want to show you a quick uh, simulation. So let me just pull up uh, my Google Chrome. Now at this point the video might go a bit choppy because my laptop's a little bit uh, old and pathetic. So I'll try to do it nice and slowly. Um, but my apologies if you find this bit tricky uh, to follow. I'm going to put the link to this simulation uh, in our Google Classroom. So I want you to just have a look at this simulation. It's the first one that comes up on Google. Okay, let me just have a look at my recording. I think you should be able to see this reasonably well now, but again, sorry if it goes a bit dodgy. So what you can see here is this is a simulation of radioactive decay. So each of these red dots signifies one nucleus. And we can give each one a half-life. So when I press play, what's going to happen is every second the computer's going to basically roll a virtual dice for every single one of these nuclei and decide whether or not it decays. So let's see what that looks like. So you can see they're turning blue when they decay. And if I reset it and play it again, it actually plays back at a different, and you'll see different ones take different lengths of time to complete because it's random each time. So every time you do it you'll see a different nuclei will be the last one left over at the end. Now what you see here is a graph of the number of undecayed nuclei here versus the time along here. And this graph you can try resetting it and playing it again what you'll find is that every single time you do it, you get almost exactly the same graph. Sometimes it might be very slightly different because obviously we are dealing with stuff that's random, but pretty much however many times you run it, you're going to see exactly the same curve. And that's really useful for us as physicists because we can use that to predict some stuff about radiation. So let's go back to this. So half-life is the amount of time taken 
for half of the unstable atoms in a sample to decay. So if I have some kind of radioactive substance here, what I can say is that in one half-life, the percentage of radioactive atoms will drop by half. Now because I've now got half the number of atoms, my activity, the number of decays per second, will also have dropped by half. After a second half-life, I have half the activity again. So you get this exponential graph where every time you have the same amount of time, the activity level drops to half of what it was previously. So initially, we have lots of activity and it decays really rapidly, but as time goes on, it decays more slowly. And that's due to the nature of probability and how it works. If you're finding that a little bit tricky, don't worry. You just have to be able to use the, the what's in the pink box. You don't actually have to um, understand too much what's going on here. Let's do a sample question then. So I've got a sample of carbon-14, and it has a half-life of 5,700 years. I've got a sample that is 5,700 years old, and its activity is 200 becquerels. So if you think of that as a graph, my time, it's saying that I'm at this point here. So I am at 5,700 years, and my activity is 200 becquerels. And it's asking, what was the activity at point zero, at the start? Well, if you think about it, it's saying that it's had one half-life of time. So if I know that half-life is the time taken for the activity to half, the activity must have halved. So what I can say is that at time zero, it must have had 400 as its half-life. So it would be 400 becquerels. Now what will the half-life be in another 5,700 years? Well, in another 5,700 years, so that would be, uh, what would that be, 11,400 years, activity will have halved again. So it was 200 in the previous half-life. If it's halved again, we can say in another 5,700 years, activity will be 100 becquerels. In another 5,700 years, hopefully you can see the activity will be 50 becquerels. So if I went over here to quick maths, quick maths, quick maths, uh, I really, really suck at maths. Uh, 17... Is that right? That doesn't look right. Some number, some big number over here. Um, I can't do maths when I'm on camera because it's awkward. Uh, that would be 50. And so on and so forth. Okay. So what I'd like you to do now for me is go ahead and have a, a go at Isaac Physics uh, 52, Radioactive Decay. Okay, so quickly, I just want to talk about detecting radiation. This is actually nothing that you uh, haven't done before, but it will just help to sum up uh, stuff we've done so far. Um, so if you remember, radiation is uh, alpha, beta, gamma. So alpha particles, they have a plus two charge. Beta minus particles are electrons, so they have a minus one charge. And gamma rays are electromagnetic rays, so they are neutral. Now, one of the things that we often do in physics is we try and detect radiation using magnets and electric fields. So here I've got alpha, beta, and gamma radiation being pushed or fired through a magnetic field. Now, if you think back to Fleming's left-hand rule, hopefully you can see where I'm going with this, and I've got a picture up there. Um, these green dots are showing a magnetic field. 
and hopefully you can remember that the crosses mean that the field is going into the page. Now when we use Fleming's left hand rule we always say that the current is direction that positive charge would travel in. So for the alpha particle you're going to point your finger into the page and your second finger, so your first finger for the magnetic field, that's going to point into the page. Your second finger for the current, that's going to point to the right of the screen and you'll see that your thumb points up. So the force on the alpha particle pushes it up towards the top of the page. For the gamma rays, well they're neutral, so they don't have a charge, so they don't get deflected at all. And then for the beta minus particles, the electrons, well those are electrons. So if current is the direction that positive charge would go, what we have to do is turn our hand around so that our current finger actually points in the opposite direction because current always has to be in the direction that positive charge would go. For our electrons are going in the opposite direction. So a really easy way of telling which type of radiation you've got is to stick it through a magnet. And alpha will bend one way and beta will bend in the opposite way. So we sometimes see that uh, in questions like these. Let's just have a go at these questions. Question one, state the nature of gamma rays. So that is an electromagnetic wave. Question two, a beam of alpha particles and beta particle passes in a vacuum between the poles of a strong magnet. Compare the deflections of the path of the two part types of particle. So uh, they will de deflect in opposite directions. That's worth one mark. Um, and then you, you're going to say why. So we're going to say because they have opposite charges. And that will be worth the second mark. Now, if a beam of beta particles passes in a vacuum through an electric field between a charge between a pair of oppositely charged magnetic plates, so that would be something like this. This one would be plus. This one would be minus. And here's my beta minus particles. So they're going like that. Well, beta particles they're negatively charged. So they're going to be attracted to the positively charged plates. So describing the path, the path is going to curve, for one mark, towards the positive plate, for a second mark. Why is it going to curve? <coughs> well, if we think about the acceleration of it, we can say force is equal to mass times acceleration. There's going to be a constant force on it, so it's going to accelerate towards the other plate. So that means the path is going to curve as it gets faster and faster heading towards it. And then we have part D. The nuclear decay equation shows the decay of an isotope of polonium. State the nature of X. Well, I've got a 4 and a 2 here, so hopefully you can say that X is an alpha particle or you can say a helium nucleus. And then we need to calculate the values of A and Z. So if you remember what I said in our previous lesson, the top row on both sides has to be equal and so does the bottom row on both sides. So on this side, my top row, I have 206 and 4, so that will give me 210 on the top row. My bottom row, I've got 82 and 2, so that will give me 84. So this polonium must be 210 for its A number, 84 for its Z number. What I want you to do now is have a go at some additional practice questions that I'm going to give you. You can mark them yourselves um, and then come back to me with any questions or concerns that you might have.